In 1967, Formula One was teetering on the edge of reinvention. The rulebook had just shifted, competitors scrambled for power, and safety was still years behind speed. Out of a small workshop in Northampton emerged a machine so compact, so versatile, that it would dominate racing for nearly two decades. The Cosworth DFI was no exotic V12, yet it redefined what an engine could be. Powerful, simple, and, in its own way, deadly. The need for a new heart from Coventry Climax to Cosworth. The mid-1960s saw Formula One in transition. For half a decade, Coventry Climax had supplied Britain's racing outfits with reliable 1.5-liter V8s. When regulations shifted to allow three-liter engines for 1966, Coventry withdrew from the sport. Suddenly, Lotus and other privateer teams were left without a competitive power unit, while Ferrari, Maserati, and BRM were preparing heavy, complex V12s and H16s that looked impressive but carried weight and fragility. Colin Chapman of Lotus faced a crisis. He needed a competitive three-liter engine and had no in-house capacity to build one. Chapman turned to Cosworth Engineering, a young company founded by Mike Coston and Keith Duckworth. Both men had backgrounds at Lotus and aviation. Duckworth especially was a first principles thinker, unwilling to compromise on clarity of design. He had already produced the highly successful FVA for Formula 2, and scaling that four-valve philosophy up to a V8 seemed logical. The only missing ingredient was funding. Chapman knocked on doors. Aston Martin declined. The British government ignored appeals, but Ford of Britain, thanks to public affairs manager Walter Hayes and engineer Harley Kopp, saw opportunity. Ford would fund Cosworth with £100,000, around $2.6 million today, in exchange for branding rights. Chapman would get his engine, Cosworth its big break, and Ford a platform to advertise itself in Europe. What emerged was the DFV, double four valve. Duckworth and Coston were tasked to produce both a Formula 2 engine and a 3.0 liter F1 engine. The project was ambitious, but clear, powerful, light, reliable, and simple. Where Ferrari relied on Baroque multi-cylinder layouts, the DFV would use fewer parts, easier maintenance, and design integration that tied engine and chassis into one structure. That structural role would make the DFV not only a power source, but also part of the car's skeleton. Thus, the stage was set. Out of necessity and smart funding, Lotus and Cosworth joined forces with Ford to create an engine that would outlive every rival and shape the very economics of Formula One. Designing the Beast, Keith Duckworth's Blueprint. Keith Duckworth believed in simplicity. The DFV was no miracle of exotic metallurgy. It was clever engineering packaged for efficiency. The block and heads were cast from aluminum, keeping weight down. At 90 degrees, the V angle gave balance and space for suspension and intake roading. Displacement was 2,993 cubic centimeters, with cylinders of 85.67 by 64.9 millimeters over square dimensions that allowed revs beyond 9,000 RPM. The defining feature was in the name, double four valve. Each cylinder carried four valves operated by dual overhead cams. This layout improved breathing, volumetric efficiency, and high rev power. Duckworth also narrowed the valve angle to 32 degrees, creating compact combustion chambers with a pent roof shape. This encouraged swirl and better air fuel mixing, raising efficiency without needing exotic fuels or compression tricks. Fuel delivery came via Lucas mechanical injection, predictable and tunable across tracks. The crankshaft was flat plane, which simplified exhaust design and gave a sharp, aggressive note. Though harsh in vibration compared to cross-plane designs, it suited racing, allowing even firing intervals. Lubrication was by dry sump, with scavenge pumps preventing oil starvation under high G-forces, Every choice was purposeful. Minimize compromises, maximize accessibility. Teams could strip and rebuild a DFV quickly, a boon for private outfits with limited resources. Most revolutionary was its role as a stressed member. Instead of being cradled in a space frame, the DFV bolted directly to the monocoque at the front and carried the gearbox and suspension at the rear. The engine itself became part of the chassis. This saved weight, increased stiffness, and simplified packaging. Chapman's Lotus 49 was designed around this philosophy, the DFV acting as spine and heart simultaneously. Initial dyno figures showed around 408 horsepower at 9,000 RPM, competitive immediately. By the late 1970s, 
refinements and higher revs would push outputs above 500. Yet even at its birth, the DFV delivered a power-to-weight ratio unmatched by most contemporaries. While Ferrari's flat 12s and BRM's H16s suffered from weight and complexity, the DFV was compact, efficient, and light enough to shift balance toward the British garagists. Duckworth had not invented new physics. He had applied engineering logic with ruthless clarity. First Blood, Lotus 49, and the 1967 Dutch Grand Prix. Debut stories rarely unfold like fairy tales, but the DFV's first race came close. At Zandvoort, the 1967 Dutch Grand Prix, Graham Hill put the brand new Lotus 49 on pole by more than half a second. The DFV's compact integration with Chapman's chassis delivered instant pace. Yet on race day, Hill's engine failed after 10 laps when gear teeth sheared in the valve train, an early reminder that even genius requires testing. But Jim Clark, Hill's teammate, carried the day. He took the lead, exploited the DFV's power and balance, and never relinquished control. Clark won convincingly, giving the DFI victory on debut. Against Brabham's Repco V8, Ferrari's heavy V12, BRM's unwieldy H16, and Honda's temperamental designs, the Lotus Cosworth package looked effortless. The wind signaled a seismic shift. Small, resourceful British teams could now beat giants with the right engine. The rest of 1967 reinforced the message. Clark secured multiple wins, though reliability problems persisted. Gear issues and early teething troubles kept consistency elusive. Still, the DFV's promise was undeniable. By season's end, rivals recognized the danger. Ferrari had power, but lacked agility. BRM's H16 proved overcomplicated. Honda oscillated between brilliance and disaster. The DFV's mix of power, lightness, and packaging stood apart. Ford and Cosworth initially intended exclusivity for Lotus, but by late 1967, Ford executives feared domination by a single team would undercut marketing. They opened the DFV to other outfits for 7,500 pounds apiece, a fraction of Ferrari's engine program costs. That decision transformed Formula One. Instead of one team benefiting, nearly the entire grid could access top-line power. For Chapman, exclusivity was gone. For the sport, a new balance of competition had begun. The debut year thus captured the DFI paradox, fragile yet fast, experimental yet decisive. It made Lotus winners, exposed flaws to fix, and shifted the axis of Formula One power from manufacturer giants to agile privateers. From monopoly to mass weapon, Ford's strategic shift. When Ford released the DFI to customer teams, it rewrote Formula One's economics. Never before had such a powerful, lightweight, and integrated engine been available at an accessible price. McLaren, Matra, Brabham, Tyrrell, Williams, and Penske lined up. Between 1967 and 1986, DFV-powered cars would win 155 of 262 Grands Prix, a staggering 59% strike rate. Entire championships were decided by DFI supremacy. In 1968, Graham Hill claimed the driver's title in a Lotus 49. That season also carried tragedy. Jim Clark's fatal crash in a Formula 2 race cut short the career of one of the DFV's greatest exponents. Still, DFV entries won 11 of 12 Grand Prix that year, shared between Lotus, McLaren, and Matra. Ferrari salvaged a single victory through Jackie Ix at the French Grand Prix. The message was clear. The DFV wasn't just dominant. It was reshaping the competitive landscape. Customer access allowed smaller teams to thrive. Ken Tyrrell's outfit, running Jackie Stewart, captured titles in 1969, 1971, and 1973 with DFV power. The Scotsman's smooth driving meshed perfectly with the engine's responsive throttle. Matra's championship, McLaren's consistency, and Williams's rise all depended on Ford Cosworth reliability and affordability. For about the cost of a modest racing program, a privateer could access cutting-edge horsepower. Technically, the DFV remained robust. Cosworth ironed out early gear issues, improving reliability. Power crept upward. By the mid-1970s, outputs approached 470 horsepower. Importantly, the DFV responded well to incremental improvements, refined materials, better valve springs, and evolving fuels. Unlike rival engines that demanded clean-sheet redesigns, 
the DFV was adaptable. It became the template for longevity in a sport defined by rapid obsolescence. By the mid-1970s, the DFV was not only a product, but an ecosystem. Its accessibility democratized F1, elevating Britain's garagists into world champions. Ferrari still fought with V12s, and Renault prepared a turbocharged revolution, but the backbone of the grid was Cosworth. The DFV had transitioned from Lotus's secret weapon to the default choice for winning teams. Formula One's balance of power tilted, perhaps forever, toward customer-friendly engineering. Ground effect and the DFV's deadly advantage. By the late 1970s, Formula One's next revolution arrived. Ground effect aerodynamics. Lotus again led the charge with the Type 78 and 79, shaping underbodies to generate downforce through Venturi tunnels. This innovation demanded narrow, compact engines to leave space for airflow beneath the car. Ferrari's flat 12, though powerful, blocked tunnels with its wide profile. The DFV's 90-degree V8, perched higher, left crucial space for underbody sculpting. Once again, Cosworth's engine became the right tool at the right moment. The Lotus 79, powered by the DFV, delivered devastating dominance in 1978. Mario Andretti and Ronnie Peterson exploited the combination of ground-effect chassis and responsive V8 to crush rivals. The DFV was not the most powerful engine on the grid, but its packaging allowed Chapman's AeroVision to flourish. Ferrari's wider flat 12s suffocated airflow, while Alfa Romeo's designs proved clumsy. The DFV's compactness translated directly into downforce and lap time. This era cemented the DFV's reputation as more than just a supplier of horsepower. It was the enabler of engineering revolutions, stiff enough to act as chassis backbone, narrow enough to allow ground effect, light enough to keep weight distribution nimble. Teams beyond Lotus adapted quickly. Williams FW07 used DFV power to capture titles in 1980, with Alan Jones crowned champion. Tyrrell, Lizier, and McLaren also built their ground effect contenders around the Cosworth 58. Reliability remained a hallmark. While Ferrari and Alpha chased horsepower at the cost of component stress, the DFI balanced speed and durability. Its throttle response, sharper than turbos and less lag-prone than rival designs, gave drivers confidence in corner exits. On tight and twisty tracks, that drivability compensated for raw power deficits. In championship arithmetic, consistency beat peaks, and the DFV remained the most complete package. Yet the very qualities that prolonged its reign also highlighted the paradox. The DFV's deadliness was not inherent in exploding pistons or fragile rods. Its deadliness lay in how it amplified every design leap around it, making cars faster than safety measures could match. The late 1970s saw speeds rise dramatically, yet barriers, runoff, and driver protection lagged. The DFV was the silent accomplice in an arms race where innovation outpaced survival infrastructure. The turbo threat and the last hurrah. Even as the DFV thrived in the ground effect era, storm clouds gathered. Renault had introduced turbocharging in 1977 with its 1.5 liter V6. Initially mocked as fragile tea kettles, turbos matured rapidly, offering power outputs beyond 600, 700, even 800 horsepower. The DFV, stuck around 500, could no longer match sheer thrust. Ferrari, BMW, and Honda all joined the turbo movement. By the early 1980s, naturally aspirated engines seemed obsolete. Still, the DFV fought valiantly. On circuits where throttle response and drivability mattered, it remained competitive. In 1982, Keke Rosberg won the Drivers' Championship in a DFV-powered Williams FW08, a testament to strategy and consistency against faster turbos. This was the DFV's last great triumph, achieved through reliability, fuel efficiency, and nimble handling rather than outright speed. It was the ultimate example of brains beating brawn, but it was also a swan song. Cosworth attempted evolutions. The DFY variant pushed revs higher and powered toward 520 horsepower. The DFZ adapted to new 3.5-liter naturally aspirated rules for 1987, extended life a little longer. 
Customer teams continued to buy Cosworth engines, grateful for affordability and proven design. But the tide was unstoppable. Turbos dominated high-speed venues, their sheer acceleration dwarfing DFV efforts. By 1983, Michel Alboreto's win in Detroit marked the last outright victory for a DF5 family engine in Formula One. The decline was bittersweet. For nearly 15 years, the DFI had been the benchmark. But F1 is relentless. Rules changed, technology advanced, and Ford itself looked to new projects like the turbocharged GBA V6. Cosworth's little giant was finally aging out, not because it had failed, but because the world around it had shifted. The very simplicity that had once been its greatest strength was now a limitation against increasingly complex power units. Yet even in decline, the DFI left an imprint on the sport's culture. Its affordability kept small teams alive during turbo escalation. Its reliability gave underdogs shots at glory, and its accessibility ensured Formula One grids remained full, competitive, and unpredictable. The DFI may have been outgunned, but it was never irrelevant. The DFVs reach beyond F1. To understand the DFV's full impact, one must look beyond Formula One. The same architecture found success in endurance racing, IndyCar, and Formula 3000. At Le Mans, the Gulf GR8, powered by a DFV, won in 1975. In Indy, the turbocharged DFX derivative conquered the Indianapolis 510 times. In Formula 3000, naturally aspirated DFVS became the backbone of the series for years. Few engines have carried dominance across so many disciplines with such consistency. This versatility stemmed from the same qualities that made it legendary in Formula One. Simplicity, reliability, adaptability. Engineers could scale, turbocharge, or tune the DFV without rebuilding from scratch. Cosworth's workshop produced hundreds of units, keeping a steady supply for teams of all sizes. This production volume also lowered costs relative to exotic engines from Italy or Germany, reinforcing the DFV's status as the everyman's weapon. Historically, the DFV's availability democratized motorsport. It blurred lines between privateer and manufacturer dominance. Teams like Tyrrell, Williams, and McLaren used DFVs to rise from obscurity to world titles. Smaller endurance outfits gained credibility at Le Mans. In America, IndyCar grids were transformed by the DFX. In each arena, the DFV embodied the same paradox, giving many the chance to win while also raising speeds to dangerous levels. By the time of its retirement from top-level Formula One in the mid-1980s, the DFV had secured 155 Grand Prix victories, 12 drivers' championships, and 10 constructors' titles. These numbers are not just statistics, but a reflection of an era. For nearly two decades, one engine defined competition, economics, and even safety debates. No other engine has so completely owned an epoch in motorsport. Death by progress, immortality by legacy. DFV wasn't banned, progress passed it. Turbos outgunned it, rules shifted, and by 1989, turbos were outlawed and 3.5 liter naturally aspirated engines arrived. Yet its legacy endures. Simplicity that empowered privateers, integration that enabled ground effect, success beyond F1, Indy endurance. Deadly meant speed outpacing safety. It killed complacency and giants, too good to last, unforgettable because it changed racing forever.